don't know why there's no sun up in the sky stormy weather for those of you who have watched reachmorenow.com or Reach More Now on YouTube recently. You probably saw the reading I did where I was wearing a very warm wool coat and a, a scarf because it was 10 degrees <laughs> in Texas. But today, it's 80 degrees here, but not for most of our nation. I'm talking about from California to Maine. The headlines read, quote, flights canceled, highways closed, as winter storm wallops the United States. Meanwhile, it's been 80 degrees in Bedford, Texas, today where Georgia and I live. It's Thursday, February 23rd, and this is Ray Monsolder with breaking news. In spite of dire warnings from Chicken Little, the sky is not falling in. Just feels like it is for most Americans right now. And in spite of all the automobile accidents being reported today, the cold weather isn't everywhere in the United States. Strangely, it's a unique mixed bag. For example, parts of Montana, Wyoming, and the Dakotas have temperatures below zero. Much of the South, from Texas to the Carolinas, have temperatures above 80 degrees. Yet the truth is more than 65 million people, 65 million people across 29 states are under winter weather alerts. The upper Midwest is expected to bear the brunt of the storm in terms of snowfall if you have friends or relatives in any of these cold areas, you might try phoning them to cheer them up. Now be mindful that they do sleep. So call them when it would be a, a normal part of the day. One last mention of this. They call it a blanket storm because most people need lots of blankets to survive. Earthquakes aren't limited to Syria and Turkey. A 6.8 magnitude earthquake yesterday struck Tajikistan near the border of China. It happened just after 6.30 a.m. local time in Tajikistan. Madagascar was hit by a slightly weakened tropical cyclone that carried wind gusts to 180 kilometers per hour. That's about 111 miles per hour and shattered parts of the east coast of Madagascar. Antakya, Turkey, hit nearly two weeks ago with a 7.8 earthquake that killed more than 41,000 people, is greatly just a pile of rubble now. Miracle stories of people being pulled out of the rubbish have stopped. And like East Palestine, Ohio, the people say the government doesn't care a whit about the area. By the way, that was former President Donald Trump 
yesterday who visited way ahead of President Biden in that devastated city in Ohio. Speaking of President Biden, yesterday he warned Russian President Vladimir Putin that his suspension of the United States Arms Treaty was a big mistake. Ooh, I bet that made Putin shake in his boots. And speaking of former President Trump, Jared Kushner and Ivana Trump have been subpoenaed for matters specifically related to the special counsel's probe of January 6th and the activities leading up to that day by the former president and his allies regarding efforts to overturn the 2020 election. We'll finally get a real briefing on exactly what happened on that January 6th. Tucker Carlson has been given over, over um, 1,000 hours of film that shows exactly what really went on before and after and also during after the illegal entrance into the White House by most who are now suffering in prison in dank conditions because they took part in that. And since I'm waxing political, who was that woman getting off an airplane in Nambia yesterday? None other than Joe's wife, Jill Biden. She was greeted with Nambian dancers dressed in their native costumes. Jill will now tour South Africa for five days. Now that's a rarity for politicians in America, especially politicians' wives. In fact, the last time a politician was there, it was Al Gore in 1996. Have you heard of that Christian revival that began on February 8th of this year at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky? It started and has spread ever since. The spark was lit into a raging fire when a few students spontaneously stayed in Hughes Auditorium on the campus following regularly scheduled chapel service that exploded into revival. They stayed there to pray and it hasn't stopped. It's continued through today and will continue on for the foreseeable future. Now why do I predict that? The revival has been compared to similar revivals at Asbury, like the one that occurred in 1970, with far-reaching effects in American culture and the growth of the Jesus movement. It began with Generation Z. More and more students poured into the chapel as they heard of what was going on and they remained in the auditorium the entire night praying and worshiping God. The smallest crowd gathered there at that moment was 50 students. The next day the students still remained there and other students began to set up coffee stations that included donuts. Pictures online 
showed the auditorium at capacity level. The revival continued, and on the fourth day, the auditorium was now way beyond capacity. On the fifth day, buses and vans from churches and other religious institutions began arriving at Asbury for the revival. Other buildings were opened for overflow crowds. Revival continued into its sixth continuous day, and more and more people arrived to enter into worship and praise to God. On February 13th, Cedarville Seminarians at Virginia Theological Seminary led Wesley's covenant service in direct response to the revival. Cedarville University is a Baptist-affiliated institution. Revival continued through the seventh day. On Valentine's Day this year, at least 22 other institutions, 22, traveled to Asbury to join the revival. Baptist-affiliated institutions from Campbellsville and Church of God Cleveland students and faculty continued to join the Asbury Revival. On the eighth day of the revival, the Washington Post wrote an article about the revival. It specifically mentioned the overflow at regularly scheduled chapel services and that Hughes Auditorium was now closed by Asbury students to all people over the age of 26. Now that decision was made to prioritize the voices of Generation Z. A simulcast of Hughes Auditorium was set up into chapels on the Asbury campus. On the 15th of February, students at Samford, not Stanford, Samford University, a Baptist-affiliated institution, remained in worship in response to the revival, according to an announcement from the university's president on Twitter. On February 16th, an announcement that Hughes Auditorium was closed from 1 a.m. to 12 p.m. and that live streaming was banned in Hughes Auditorium and the chapels. The announcement was made on the university's Instagram account. Asbury University established a set schedule for the revival and published it on their website. The university marked February 24th as an end date for services held on Asbury's campus. Asbury sent out a letter to the parents of students addressing the revival and how it interfered with classes. Nevertheless, the revival continued following the university's regularly scheduled chapel service. So contrary to the desires of the officials at Asbury, Hughes Auditorium remained open to the public, again giving seating preference to those in high school through the age of 25. At 5 p.m., a fourth external venue 
Mount Freedom Baptist Church service was stopped, ended because thousands of people were lined up in cold waiting for space in Hughes Auditorium. On February 18th, the revival continued. Security concerns over tens of thousands of visitors, tens of thousands, heightened both government and Asbury official worries. The Asbury revival, nevertheless, continued into its twelfth day. Then evening services for the public were stopped. Now all that I've shared with you so far can be read again on Wikipedia, which is not famous for its Christian content. Obviously, Wikipedia was impressed greatly to have written all that. But this is just the beginning of the story. Oh, there's much, much more. The revival is sweeping the nation among Christian colleges who are having very similar awakenings. And when that happens, it starts to burst out into communities. Now I'll have more about this on tomorrow's newscast, a whole lot more. This revival is like the Great Awakening. It's spreading out to college after college. Pray for those involved. It's time that the verse in Acts 2.17 becomes a repeated event. And then comes Jesus. And now it's time for It Happened in America. Have you ever wondered about how hard it must have been like to carve the faces on Mount Rushmore? Gutson Borglum, a noted sculptor of his time, gazed at the Black Hills of South Dakota and wrote, quote, American history shall march along that skyline. Now, the great sculptor had been invited there by a local official familiar with work, uh, with the, his work in Georgia. A colossal bas relief on the face of Stone Mountain in Minnesota depicted Confederate heroes. It was an awesome thing to see. Hoping to draw tourists to his state, the South Dakotan envisioned a parade of famous frontiersmen carved in rock. But Borglum felt the memorial should represent the nation as a whole and proposed portraits of Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson, and Theodore Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt later suggested including the suffragette leader Susan B. Anthony, but that got nowhere. The site the artist chose, the nearly perpendicular face of the six thousand foot Mount Rushmore offered a solid expanse of granite beneath its fissured surface. Facing generally south, it caught the sun most of the day. Work began in the summer of 1927 using models on a scale of one inch to a foot. Borglum plotted the presidential features, transferred his measurements to the mountainside, and instructed his crew where to cut up the rock. Most of the sculpting 
was done by experienced miners working with jackhammers and dynamite they removed some 400,000 tons 400,000 tons of outer rock cutting to within three inches of the final surface they were so skilled with the tools of their trade that they could even contour the eyes and the lips. The sculptor's traditional mallet and chisel were used very little. As each face took shape, Borgon studied with binoculars from several miles away and made minor adjustments, working on hidden flaws in the rock, it reportedly forced him to rethink the composition, and after the arrangement, altering them to, with the figures. One mistake in cutting rock, for example, ruined Jefferson's head, which was to have been on the right side of Washington's head. It was blasted away and recarved on the right side of Washington. The project dragged on for 14 years. Its cost escalated to one million dollars. When Borglum died in 1941, his dream, the creation of the world's most gigantic sculpture, was near completion. Borglum's son oversaw the final work. The monument on Mount Rushmore has evoked mixed feelings. Some see it as a declaration of nature. Others, like President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, were amazed not only by its magnitude, but as he said, its permanent beauty and its importance. This is Ray. I've seen the carvings on Mount Rushmore, and I'm still awestruck at what I saw. Put it at least on your bucket list. And finally, this is very short, but it's true, and I want you to think about it if it were America. It is a law, a law in Cuba that all drivers have to pick up hitchhikers once they see them. <laughs>